Well, Croeso Chigi, Diolch Amamino, it's great to, uh, to see you tonight. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, tonight, I'm joined by Dr. Dean uh, Burnett, who's a neuroscientist, um, a published author, uh, um, Idiot Brain, and another best selling uh, books. And tonight, we're really going to be talking about the, the, the brain in lockdown uh, and how that's affected uh, how we uh, think uh, and uh, feel. Um, I, I suppose just just to the at the start, uh, Dean, um, saying one of your books is is the idiot brain. So maybe an idiot's guide to what neuroscience is and what it what it teaches us. Yeah, it's uh, the study of the uh, the brain and nervous system, like how it works, how it functions, how it ended up like it is, and how it reacts and responds to all the things that we experience. You know, it's a it's a very fundamental science in that respect because there's nothing humans do which doesn't involve the brain in many ways so yeah it's like a broad approach to how the brain works and you know but there's so much of the brain that it's there's a lot to get through there so yeah so it's a, it's the study of the brain and what it does yeah okay. great, great so so turning to um you know the the, the, the core really of tonight's discussion you know how, um uh, e easy question to start dean how, how is the brain doing <laughs> during lockdown um <clears throat> well Pardon me. There's always the way it's going to be different for every single person because you know the brain's a very, very diverse organ. Everyone's is different. You know, we think that everyone's individual fingerprints are different, and that's just some patterns and a bit of skin. The brain's going to be much more different again. But uh, in general, uh, we're going to see, or we are seeing, I think, a lot more uh, stress, a lot more uh, underlying anxiety, uh, because we are all in a more stressful situation. There are many things which uh, cause the brain to experience stress from a human perspective. A lot of that is a loss of control, uh, a loss of routine, um, anything sort of even vaguely uh, which could present a, th a threat or danger is recognized as a cause of stress because we have such powerful brains, we can we can, ex we can expect things, we can rationalize and we can predict the outcomes and they can stress us out even if they never happen. Like you could be stressed because your company's undergoing a merger and your job might be lost, that might never happen. And it's not gonna you know, cause you any physical harm, but it's a big source of stress. And that's in normal times when you know, the world's chugging along normally. But now we're in a very serious uh, financial situation because obviously the economy's taken a massive hit from lockdown. We are in, uh, we've lost all our routines. We are restricted as to where, when we can go. Um, all our usual outlets for getting rid of stress, you know, like going to the, the pub, going to the gym, going swimming, going doing sport, going to be here on other people, those are denied to us. Um, so, even on like a, even in the basic sense, there's a lot more to be stressed about, and that's without including the fact that there is a genuinely dangerous, potentially deadly virus out there in the world. This is pandemic, so there are so many different things which are going to be leading to increased levels of stress in the general population right now. And again, that's on an, an, an individual basis. If you have children like I do, you're going to be doing the homeschooling as well, and there's all the pressure of that to get that right because obviously you care about your children, look after other people too. So. Yeah, we are seeing uh, a general increase in levels of stress and anxiety, and that probably is going to be leading to um, greater levels of mental health uh, <clears throat> um, sort of falling in, in in the near future. So, yeah, I think people are generally more stressed, but they have every right to be, and that'll have a lot of knock-on effects. <clears throat> uh, I, I, classically, for, you know, I mean, from much of my own reading, um, I, I, you associate maybe anxiety attacks, which is a particular f a form of, of stress, is it, uh, Dean? Mm. Um, yeah. with, with with social situations, but it, I mean, are, would some people have something like an anxiety attack in uh, in lockdown, even though they're they're they're, uh, they're interacting less? Yeah, that's um, again. It, there's so many different potential causes of anxiety. I mean, social anxiety is one of the more common. Uh, manifestations of it because we are such a social species like well a great deal of our development our sense of identity our sense of self our how we evaluate ourselves and what, how good we are at things and our sense of self-worth is based largely on other people and their reactions to us and their behavior towards us and how they feel about us so you know so much of who we are and how we value ourselves is based on other people and therefore when people reject us that causes more stress than you'd think even though it's technically not physically dangerous so social anxiety is a big thing but obviously now we're seeing the opposite problem in that uh, people aren't getting enough human contact or face-to-face -face contact which our brains have evolved to 
adapt to and expect and you know, are geared towards um, which use it. it's, a, it's a valuable source of information to the typical brain and now we're being denied that so you know online communication is is, is a nice it's a handy uh, substitute but it's not the same thing and you will get people having sort of anxiety attacks because they can't do anything about it they can't you know they feel lonely they feel cut off they feel isolated and there aren't really any options right now for dealing with that if you are going to you know, stick to the lockdown rules which you should obviously um so yeah you will probably see anxiety on the other side of the scale like rather than afraid of people judging you just like a lot a lack of people like judging you and interacting with you these are two separate but sort of related causes of anxiety which you're probably going to see a lot of at the moment when we are being kept apart uh, so what what are people uh, um, doing from from what you can see to try and sort of reduce these uh, the, the stress level in in, um, in lockdown? You know what what are the sort of um, practices that uh, you know people are adopting really to try and cope with this? Um, I think it's all sort of organic. I don't think people are necessarily thinking. I will do this to alleviate my stress, but it's sort of like an unconscious thing. It's like you, you do something to make yourself feel better. That's what we always do. Like it's a form of self-medication in a way. And that you think, well, I'm stressed. What do I know that stops me feeling stressed, makes me happier? I'll do that. You know, people that can lead to bad things. People can drink a lot more and smoke a lot more, or like just indulge in other ways. Or people can do more constructive things. And we are, well, we are seeing a lot of. If you follow social media feeds, you see a lot more like baking right now, a lot more gardening, a lot more home projects, things like jigsaws, or you know, even obviously these are ways just to pass the time when you can't do anything else. But they also will be in part in a sense of control, a sense of achievement, a sense of progress from one state to the next, which is perhaps otherwise being denied when you're being cut off from your workplace or your friends or any other sort of normal metric by which you, you know, um, monitor the progress of your life. So, you know, people are getting into more home projects, more hobbies and things, and that will be a useful way of maybe not dealing with all the stress, but at least alleviating it somewhat, because you have a sense of control of what you're doing. You can see, you know, you can see your own progress. It's progressing nicely. You are developing yourself. You are acquiring new skills. And these are all good and healthy ways of reducing stress, if not just, if not removing it entirely. So whether they mean to or not, that is probably a good, a good outcome of what people are doing under these you know, trying circumstances. I, I, I mean, would you say, I mean, in, 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 introverts generally are coping better than extroverts, or is it, isn't it as simple as that? It's, it's a more cultural perception, the whole introverts versus extroverts uh, thing. There <clears throat> um, is you know, some, some merit to it. It is actually a thing which happens. Some people are far more comfortable with their own company, and some thrive on you know, attention and people being around, being around other people. It's it's a tricky one because again, no one's entirely introverted, no one's entirely extroverted. Like there's a lot of assess, um, uh, research and data which shows that even if you are the most extroverted person, you just thrive on the company of others. You will still need downtime. You still need some privacy because the act of engaging other people on a face to face basis, as much as people might enjoy it, it is um, it's demanding for for the brain because it's not like you know, it's an active process you have to be aware of what they're saying be aware of what you're saying to them you have to react to what they're saying in real time you have to be constantly aware of what you're doing how you're looking how you're standing how you're, how you're expressing yourself what's going on around you so it's it's a demanding process and the brain has finite resources that can only manage for so long so even the most giddy actuated person will need some downtime uh, of course some people are far more comfortable with that and they will probably be uh, embracing this situation a bit more and there are certain cultural factors you know a lot of you know, the subcultures and things people will be far more content to remain with themselves with their family in the household that's, you know, that's a lot of people just do that anyway and yeah yeah but so you know a degree of introversion extroversion may be an influential factor in how well you're handling lockdown but it won't be like the be all and end all because you know, when you're, even if you're the most introverted person the knowledge that you can leave the house and go and find someone to speak to if you want to, that'll be a reassurance. Like, uh, but when you when you're denied that, that'll be a stressful for anyone, really. I suppose, and that it's another thing that you're being cut off from. You don't have the option to do anything about the problem you're dealing with right now, whereas you often do, and that can make a big difference to you know, your, your, your typical human brain. Yeah, I, I, I've always thought of myself as an outgoing introvert, which sounds like a contradiction. You know. yeah, but it's entirely possible, you know. It's, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we are complex beings, yeah. Yeah, we're all in the continuum, really. And, and, and we all need some degree of sociability and social interaction, yeah, because we're social animals. Mm. And that's, mm. 
absolutely. Part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we, 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 we're talking a lot at the, at the moment about how this uh, universal experience, we're all experiencing uh, uh, the COVID crisis and the lockdown, you know, directly in a, in a personal lives in a different way. Um, to what extent do you think it's going to change the dial in some way? You know, it's going to have some kind of long-term consequences uh, on, on maybe where we are on this continuum of, of uh, um, you know, uh, our level of, of social interaction. You know, will, will, will things not revert maybe to the to the same? Uh, are we going to all become more 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 of a nation of loners after lockdown? Do you think? Um. <clears throat> I would be surprised if that did happen in terms of, you know, we, 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 we get so used to our own company, we stick to it. Uh, like I said, we are a very sociable species. We are arguably the most social species out of them all. Like humans are alarmingly, you know, it may not seem that way whenever you look at Twitter for up to three seconds or the news at any point, but we are still regarded as the most social animal because I think you have to bear in mind, although there are plenty of people who are very unpleasant to other people, there are still 7 billion humans on this planet and we seem to just tolerate each other's presence rather well compared to other species. You know, if you had 7 billion chimps on the planet for some reason, then a week later you'd have like 2 billion. They, they would not handle that well at all. Mm. And it, uh, you know, so we, we are like innately sociable. And I don't think a few months or even like the best part of a year of lockdown isolation is going to undo millions of years of evolution in that direction. But it could easily lead to more, you know, perhaps positive things in that we become more used to our own company. We don't, uh, you know, it, it sets a good, or maybe not really good, but it sets a precedent in that we have spent a long time now sort of getting along by ourselves. So we, you know, most people will know now that they can do that unless they were particularly badly affected by it. So you won't necessarily have people desperate to get out and about at all hours. Maybe at first, once you can, because it sort of becomes a novelty again. But <clears throat> everyone now has the knowledge of how they handle more isolated existences uh, better. So you might not see people maintaining traditional like you know, everyday habits that they would have done before and i think you know this has been a rather it was a boom time for social connections online so we've seen a big surge in video calling technology like what we're using now and to people having social gatherings online and we I imagine we'll see more of that because obviously my wife and i have done it a few times and that you can have a social gathering without leaving the house you've got small children and that's just a handy thing to be able to do so I think it set a lot of interest in new precedents, which I think will endure because they offer an alternative. And especially, it's not going to go away, this, this knowledge that you know, when you go outside, there's a virus in the air which could you know, conceivably harm you or those you love. And that's something that's going to be hard to shift that as, a sort of, as, a, as an innate uh, sort of just a subconscious awareness that we will develop over time. So I think we will see changes and differences, but I don't think they'll be as stark as making us all loners. I just think there will be some interesting uh, adjustments to how we go about our daily lives when we've had to go through all this for such a prolonged period. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you mentioned being, being a, um, a parent of young children. I, I've uh, in the same position, and, and in, in some ways, in terms of my social life, it, there's not actually not that much difference. In fact, it's brought everyone down now down to the same level as me you know, able to get out and we're able to you know uh, connect through zoom and house party and and uh, hmm. it's it, the, the the sense of fomo yeah fear of missing yes. out isn't hmm. so strong and that can be a little bit toxic can not it yes absolutely it's um say like that's one of the th reasons why people sort of get involved so much like other people are doing things which you're not doing and that can make you feel excluded and isolated which is a really big deal because of what, what social species we are so it's, sort of, it's often referred to in a sort of jokey way but it is genuinely you know a subconscious concern the brain seems to have we are so sensitive to rejection of any sort or anything it seem could be perceived as such that we you know strive to avoid it but now that we know that everyone else is stuck indoors too and there are no pubs open, there are no shows going on, there are no gigs happening which we're not invited to, that can and has proven to be a bit of a reassurance. Like if, There's a recent um, study published uh, about reports which show that children, uh, school-age children are experiencing like a decline in just general mental health because of anxiety and stress and so are pensioners and the shielded. But the adolescents uh, aren't really, they aren't reporting any particular shift in mental health stuff because you know, that's a particular time of your life when you are at the most sensitive to being excluded and being missed out and they know they're not now and like they're, they're allowed to use their phones a lot more and connect online like they want to do anyway and they're not being made to get up early which is bad for teenage brains um to go to school so you know it's probably a good time for adolescents in some respect in terms of mental health but you do see 
the downside of that is in people who are sort of used to being look at me i'm the best one look at look how i achieve it you're seeing like i think i've mentioned another context of early on in the lockdown so people saying okay after this after all this stuff after several months at home if you come out without having lost a lot of weight or without finishing your project or improving your business you never lack the time you lack the will and that's a really dangerous thing to be saying to people it's it's sort of like imagine someone's on compassionate leave saying well you should get your taxes sorted out now or you know you should fi finally finish that project it's, it's not why we're off we're not off work for a jolly this is a very stressful anxiety inducing time and then adding expectations and you know compounding people's inferiority complex on top of that isn't a really healthy approach at all and my personal feeling is that people who say stuff like that as in you know now you've got the time you should definitely improve yourself are perhaps the most insecure of all because it's you no know, tantamount to you see people online like well, they get in a new relationship every picture of them is all lovey and kissy and all hearts and roses and how much they love each other and studies have shown that these people tend to be in the most insecure relationships and it's sort of like faking it till you make it they sort of try to compensate for the doubts they have about the relationship they're in by insisting otherwise and declaring to the world that this relationship is so solid and often it's not and it's like a similar thing whereby if people say well i'm going to use this time to really improve myself and everything and so should you odds are they maybe they're not they're actually sort of more afraid that they're not going to you know feel as good or be as uh, looked up to after this in in in, in light of all that's going on and that's not you know it's not nice to take that on other people or make their lives slightly worse you know, to feed their own insecurities is my personal opinion yeah, so 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 great that people are uh, doing you know more baking and maybe learning languages or doing you know seven minute work at uh, at home, but you you know you don't necessarily have to Instagram it. Uh, you know, no, of, not, if you want to, it's fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with you know showing off your project. Like I say, we are social creatures. We we like interaction. It's it's fine to want interaction and seek it out, but it's when you sort of try and impose a sense of superiority or like I'm better than you. Look at what I'm doing. That's not good at a time like this you don't know other people's situation like you may be loving this like there's that guy who the start of lockdown did a marathon in his back garden and which fair enough if that's what he likes to do he can do that you know just run around the garden 500 times or however long it takes great you know whatever you need to do to keep yourself centered and things but i think it's reported in the metro or something someone saying like while you were sunbathing this man ran a marathon it's like oh so it's wrong to sunbathe now it's wrong to relax and take some downtime in the middle of a pandemic uh, you know, when it's the most stressful time of anyone's life at the moment. So, yeah, so I, I do find a bit sort of, you know, share by all means, judge, don't do that. That's not, um, that's not helpful. Um, Dean, I, I suppose, you know, without a, a shadow of a doubt, the, the most negative aspect of all of this crisis, of course, of, of the, the many people that we that uh, we've lost, uh, and you yourself, of course, have uh, have experienced this uh, directly with mm -hmm. the loss of your father. And uh, um, can you talk a little bit about you know uh, how you cope with with that grief in these you know very very um, challenging circumstances? Yeah, it, uh, it's been a very, very, very hard time for myself and my family. Um, so like I, I, I know I come across and sound functional now, but it's still something I'm dealing with. And like, it was unexpected. My father was 58 and otherwise perfectly healthy, and he just contracted it the start of you know, March when Boris Johnson was saying we should stay open and shake hands with everyone. So that was, you know, that's that's another issue. And it's been a hard time uh, because, you know, we when it when you experience grief it's very normal to have you know your other close friends and family around those you still have to you know to reinforce your bonds to people coming to help you out they want to help you they want to you want to grieve together as, a, as part of a part of a, a cohesive unit and uh, I haven't been able to do that most people haven't because of the lockdown I have a wife and two children at home have been you know, absolute godsend to me and they are everything they are my whole world at the moment I'm always have been obviously but I can't wallow in grief because my children are eight and four. They don't, you know, they are stressful enough. They have a stressful enough existence right now. They've lost uh, contact with all their friends. They don't have their school to go to. They've got no routine. They keep getting told there's a scary virus out there and they've just lost their grandfather. And, you know, to compound, you know, seeing daddy sat in his bed constantly just, you know, curled up in a ball isn't something I can, in good conscience, inflict on them. And some people might differ, like some people might not have a choice in the matter, but, you know, I couldn't pile on all, all that my wife as well so i've had to just power through it and technically i've had to do it alone because 
again, my family want to be around. I want to see them. They want to see me. They want to come around and do everything possible, do all the cooking and cleaning and, uh, you know, all, all the things which, uh, you know, grief should normally, you should put aside for grief normally, but they can't because of the lockdown, because of the pandemic, which is the reason we're in this situation. So it has proven to be really hard. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say I've had it harder than other people because, I mean, especially in the pre-COVID world, because I don't know really. I've never experienced such a close loss as this. You know, the, was my grandfather when I was like 14 and he was 60 odd, but it's, this is a lot more, it was, it was unexpected. It was sudden. It was, there's no prior warning to it. It didn't, it doesn't make any sense in, in terms of, you know, how things are supposed to work. So we've had to, you know, had to endure what we've gone through in isolation. And that, I feel it does compound matters. It does really make things a lot worse. And I say, I feel kind of functional now, but I'm wondering if I'm undecided. Is, it, is this because I'm inherently a neuroscientist, so I know what's happening. I've worked in psychiatry for so many years. Not that I, I can handle grief. It's just that I know sort of what's going on inside my own head, and I can be more rational about it. So have I got over it like that? Or am I just, because life is so monotonous right now, I have so such a strict routine, like in the house, do nothing else. Have I just sort of put it to one side? Or when the world goes back to normal a bit, I can see my family again. Am I going to, is it all going to come flooding out? You know, am I going to have a bit of a breakdown then? I don't know yet, because... It's, un it's impossible to tell, but yeah, it's been extremely hard. You know, it's, it's hard enough losing someone anyway, but under, you know, circumstances where it should have been avoidable, where you can't see anyone else and no one can do anything for you, despite all their offers of help, it's, it's proven extremely challenging. Like, you know, I can't imagine what someone else is going through in a similar situation to me who doesn't have the support that I have. And I like, you know, I'm, I'm a writer. I'm a, I'm a international published, published author. So I have a reliable income. People are buying more books now. So I don't have the financial stuff to worry about at least. And, to go through what I've gone through when you're like maybe a single parent and in financially uncertain circumstances without a reasonably sized house or whatever, I can't imagine what it must be like for those people. They, they have my undying respect, honestly. Um, some uh, bereaved families uh, have uh, expressed some anger that they've felt over uh, mm. some of the messages from some of the. Um, politicians and indeed some of the actions etc i mean it, it, you know everyone will respond different differently and uh, i mean do you share some of those feelings yourself? uh yes absolutely obviously i do think the um the government boris johnson's government um i do hold them responsible for my father's death in many ways like i said he contracted the virus when other countries were locking down and during that two-week period when they were told to lock down but decided not to the whole herd immunity thing, the whole take it on the chin approach, which you know, obviously directly contributed to my father's demise. And that's not something I can really ever forgive or forget. And you know, if they'd handle it better afterwards, they can say like, oh, bad call perhaps. But the whole exercise of the government since has been just a, an example of face saving. And the whole Dominic Cummings affair, that really did bring out in the open how little they seem to care and how much absolute disrespect they have for people like me in my situation. I mean, short of coming to my house and spitting in my face and spitting on my father's remains, I don't know how much more disrespectful they could have been for what I and people like me have gone through, you know, maintaining, obeying the lockdown rules at the worst possible time when all you want to do is see someone, see those you care about, to just to, just to have a hug with someone, just to make a connection with someone who's still got in your life and deny, you know, being denied it and denying myself it because if I did it, that would mean other people may have a greater risk of going through what I've gone through. And I could not really wish to inflict that on anyone. That's not something I can ever, in good conscience, even contemplate doing. And then you find out that Dominic Cummings, the most powerful man in government, clearly, is just wandering up and down the country. Uh, and even if he'd apologized for it, I wouldn't have accepted that, but I would have allowed it to go, well, that's ridiculous. And we, we know they're like that. But it was the attempt to cover it up, which was just despicably disgusting to me. Boris Johnson saying, that he did what any good parent would do. So that's one of the things that stuck with me the most, and that I didn't do that, and I don't know anyone else who did that. So anyone who didn't do that isn't a good parent by default. Uh, but even if he believed that, even Dominic Cummings' own story of how he explained his actions, that he thought his wife was coming down with uh, COVID-19, so he went to get childcare at his parents' place. So he, you know, he thought his wife was genuinely sick, so he put her and their four-year-old child in a car for upwards of six hours, trap the child in a contained environment with someone with a virus, short of injecting it directly into him. It's harder to imagine a way to give someone the virus more effectively. And then that whole Bernard Castle thing, he uh, was to test his eyesight to see if he could safely drive. So to test his eyesight to see if he could drive, 
he put his wife and child in the he put his four-year-old child in the car for 30 minutes when he thought he might be too blind to drive these aren't like if i did that those are two examples of risking your child's life for no reason if i did that i would expect social services to be called and my children taken off me but because he did it, it that's you no know, that's presented as good parenting and it's clearly not and no one seemed to pick up on that either i think we just accept these excuses as as if they believed if, if anyone believes that's good parenting then they should be investigated for what, what they're doing to their children. It's disgraceful. But that's just one example of the many, many things that have happened to me on behalf of this government, which I cannot even begin to fathom how, how do you process that emotionally? What do you do to, in, in response to people in charge of your well-being who behave like this? How, how is anyone meant to react to this in a positive or, you know, or a helpful way? It's not possible. It's just compounding grief upon grief it's compounded insult it's like ripping open the wounds and pouring a bag of salt in uh, for, for no discernible reason either apart from their own well-being they're far more concerned with saving face and saving their jobs and saving lives and i cannot get my head around how how this could be allowed to happen and, and in a sense uh dean i mean it connects with with your earlier point about the fact that we we are very social beings and you know mm -hmm humans are actually quite um, um, prepared to for, to uh, forgive fallibility in others. But one thing that does really stick in our throats, I think, is, is hypocrisy and double standards. Mm. That, that Absolutely. Against, mm. We're almost hardwired against it, you know. Well, we are actually, yes. Like there's, there's a lot of studies which show that humans have an innate awareness of fairness. Obviously, that how you evaluate fairness is going to vary from person to person or your own upbringing your own education your own background like you can say like you know the benefit system is fair or if you're on the more right-wing side of the thing you can it's a logical argument that i work hard and i have to pay taxes and these people don't work and they get money how is that fair and that's you know it, you it's a far more complex system but from a personal perspective that actually has a logic to it at least you can see that from an instinctive subjective point of view that would be upsetting but yeah we do have um it's a tribal thing we are you know we we have evolved to maintain tribal unity as best we can so people behaving in unfair unjust ways does tend to trigger like the anger response and observing fairness and experiencing fairness does cause activity in the reward path is the bring the path to make this feel good and make this feel pleasure these things respond to fairness at the most instinctive level so yeah it is definitely a very innate instinctive thing yeah um we've got some questions uh from from the public uh dean okay. um so alison uh lenihan has uh sent a question uh while i um just on the on this uh, very theme while i real realize uh, uh, um, Dean is not a bereavement counsellor. How do I begin to process the horror and the shock of my mother's death? Uh, she died in March from COVID-19, uh, which we caught in the hospital while undergoing cancer treatment. Obviously, uh, uh, condolences go out to you. Of course, yes. Um, it's, it's a hard one for you to say. Like I said, I'm still at the early stages of my own grief. And I, like I said, you know, I don't know, have I got over the worst of it? Or have I sort of learned to deal with it quicker than some because of my neuroscientific knowledge or my psychiatric training, or am I just, you know, is it on hold for the time being because I'm not in a situation where I can afford to indulge and express it. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure how well I'm dealing with it uh, in a sort of, you know, long-term, uh, in a long-term sense. And it's a sort of thing, it's hard to say this, but you know, it, they say time heals all wounds. It doesn't heal wounds in the sense that they go away. There is actually a f uh, phenomenon in the brain called the fading affect bias in that negative emotional memories fade faster than um, pardon me, than, than positive ones. And it doesn't mean that you forget the negative things. You never do. But it's that the power of those memories to make you feel sad or make you feel angry or feel, feel scared, that wanes faster than the good memories of... Um, how people you know like the positive memories you have with your parents like me and my father have lots of good memories um see the memory of his past is incredibly painful and sad and i won't ever forget it but 10 years down the line i'll remember being sad but i won't necessarily think the memory itself will make me sad but i'll always remember that the good memories will make me happy it's a weird sort of self-defense mechanism of the brain so negative emotional experiences are perhaps most relevant because they keep you safe you know to be aware of these things but dwelling on them isn't necessarily the most helpful in terms of well-being so it's the sort of thing like you know it's horrible right now it'll be horrible for the foreseeable it'll never be good but it won't be as visceral as it is 
uh, just by just just how the brain works, unless you have its underlying disorder, in which case that's that thing is scrambled anyway. So I can't really offer any uh, particular advice in terms of what to do about this or to cope with it. But I, I, I can say, given how the brain works, it will improve over time. Just how long that takes is hard to say. And it's just the case that we're all figuring this out right now. You're not alone in this. It is very much a terrible experience. It's it's not. I'm, I'm, I don't doubt there'll be many papers and many publications written about this, uh, the phenomenon of grief under lockdown in the next few years. So, yeah, so you're not alone. Um, I, I can't offer you any particular strong advice, but you're not alone, and time will, yeah, will have its effects. And um, I guess to sort of just, just uh, hold the course, I guess. I mean, it's something we have to get through together, even though, even though we're not in the same place right now. Yeah. Um, question here from uh, Dr. Matt Morgan, who's a, who's a fellow author. Uh, uh, yeah. I know Matt, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, on an intensive care uh, mm -hmm. specialist at the Heath, of course. Mm -hmm. Do weekends matter? Uh, the week now feels homogenous without that Friday feeling. Do predictable down uh, periods have psychological uh, advantages? Uh, I would say yes. I say uh, Matt Morgan, an intensive care doctor, author of Critical, one of those genuine heroes we hear about these days. Um, it, it is important. Uh, again, it's not if you sort of abandoned the concept of weekends and had every day the same. It wouldn't necessarily do you any harm, uh, only lasted harm. But again, we are creatures of routine to the brain-like structure, and a lot of that's been lost right now. We don't have a set workday. We don't have a nine to five. We don't have you know, on Fridays I do sport. On Thursdays I do the swimming. Like, we don't have any of these uh, sort of key. Uh, facets of the week which tell us you know, when or what happens when because the brain doesn't tell time like a clock it's not like digital or like just metric it's it's more analog it's more qualitative we tell time in the sense of landmarks like it's been a long time since my last holiday it's only a few months until my birthday we don't sort of say specific you no know, units of time we'd say time since time too long and short so but having a sort of structure in, in, in the week is going to be useful and important for a lot of people because it just gives you a sense of normality. It gives you a sense of um, order, a sense of routine, which can be good. It helps you anchor your, your life. It makes you, you know, if you lose a sense of time, you become kind of adrift and you don't sort of have any, you know, it, it's something to anchor your motivation to. So I would say, yes, keep the weekends as uh, weekendy as you can. And because I'm doing that, but I've had to do that anyway, because I work from home. I was working from home since 2018. So I don't, you know, I've, I've had to do that as it is. So I would advise people to do that too, because... If you can measure time in landmarks, it's a lot easier than just you know checking a calendar, ticking things off, and then becoming kind of a a drift in terms of how you progress. Uh, question here from uh, Wendy Randall: uh, What, in uh, Dr. Dean's opinion, will be the long term effects psychologically of this virus regarding getting on with our lives? Yeah, I think I've, I've mentioned a few possible things in that. Again, this virus and the lockdown and the quarantine is setting a lot of precedents, and uh, no, it's challenging a lot of um, uh, a lot of preconceived notions we had in the pre-COVID world. Like you have to go to the office all the time, you have to constantly be out and be sociable. And again, there are the good and bad things. I mean, um, I think I've been particularly interested in the impact of social media on our everyday existence because for so long now it's been touted as the great evil you know it's just corrupting children's brains and it's bad for you and it's too much stress and things but overnight essentially it went from the, a, a big vice to a godsend it's like literally the only way we can communicate anymore so i do think the role of social media is going to be uh, kind of reevaluated, and people will be a lot more comfortable with it when they weren't before purely because just by just by trial by fire you know, so they've had to use it and have to get on with it and Hopefully, we'll see a bit more community cohesion in that you know people were perhaps a bit more individualistic before the virus, but now we have had a lot more cause to, to shop local, to stay local, to get on with our neighbours, to meet people in the street and stuff. And that was always a possibility. I think when you have an external problem, external danger, that's when people tend to unify a lot better. Because before, like everyone had their own thing, you can have because of the internet, especially you could have people of all walks of life and all political persuasions living on the same streets. But there, the, the coronavirus is something other. It, you know, it's us versus it, not them. It and it, you know, it, it hopefully will have a unifying effect that we sort of see a bit more um, 
it's like a slightly more harmony amongst neighborhoods and just cultures in general because we are sort of seemingly acting a bit more in lockstep than we did before so hopefully that'll be more of a, a lasting thing yeah and, and this links to a question by uh, Gaj Williams as well uh, who says uh, since COVID I've, I've walked to my local shop to purchase fresh local food I've enjoyed the community spirit uh, and avoided uh, driving uh, and queuing in um, populated areas um, you know do you think that th th this is actually good good for us yeah, there could definitely be benefits to this, and you know, I mean, how sustainable it is in terms of you know, uh, you know supply chains and stuff. That's a whole. That's an economic question. That's not one I'm really qualified to answer. But I do think you know, staying local or shopping local is. It's not like you know. Again, it's a complex thing. You might not have the best things locally, and not every local business is going to be especially you know moral and ethical and good. So there are plenty of you know, local people who aren't necessarily you know, out for the, the, the community's benefit, but. Yeah, I think exploring more locally and indulging in more local things, it can only be good for the environment for a start, you know, rather than to drive everywhere and ship things from overseas and so on and so on. So, yeah, there are definitely positives to this if it can turn into a lasting effect rather than just a temporary convenience. And, yeah, so, again, it sets the precedent that, you know, shopping local, staying local, meeting my local neighbourhood is a good thing. And hopefully that will be a lasting positive we can take away from all this. Uh, just uh, uh, finally, really, on uh, social media and the sort of the, 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 the I suppose, double-edged nature of social media mm -hmm. that you pointed to. Um, uh, in, in, in my line of work, I mean, it's, it's, an, un, it's, a, it's an inevitable and necessary tool, uh, really, of mm -hmm. communication. Um, but one thing I found useful is, is the importance of balance. Uh, and so actually... Uh, and you know, taking breaks effectively. You know that you, you you can't always be on. There's a temptation. You know, uh, I've fallen into this trap sometimes. I have to have an opinion on everything <laughs> all the time. You know, yeah. as if the world is waiting with bated breath. You know, what what is Adam Price going to say in 140 characters on everything? And actually, um, you know, taking taking some time out is is okay. Uh, and actually, then you you have better and higher quality interactions with people if you do that. Yeah, totally. Like I think there's been some studies to show that you know social media can be both good and bad for your mental health or mental well-being, depending on how you use it. If you are a passive user, like just constantly scrolling through timelines of people having more fun than you or people having different views to you, that can be bad because it sort of makes you feel left out, isolated, inferior, like judged or i'm anxious about who's out there what they're saying but if you're an active user if you actually engage with other people uh in a, you know not necessarily a toxic way but a positive way of saying oh yes me too um that, that's bad or this is good and so on uh, that can be more protective of your mental health because it makes you feel connected it makes you feel understood it makes you feel like you're involved in things uh but yeah it is especially now because it's, it's tricky now because beforehand you say take a break from social media it's it's good advice. It's hard to do because the brain does not like an unfinished task and social media is never technically finished. It just keeps constantly refreshing. Mm. But now, obviously, because obviously we can't communicate with people on a face-to-face -face basis, it's like all or nothing. You're, either, you're connected or you're not, or you're engaged with people or you're not. And you know, that's, a, that's a bit more of, a, bit more of a, a binary to it. And that's hopefully that'll ease as people get back into each other's lives. But yeah, it's, it's a mixed blessing and it's interesting to see how, it, uh, how it's progressing. And, and one of the things that we can learn from neuroscience, really, is that there, there, there is a tendency, isn't there, for us to to fix it on the one or two negative comments, <laughs> ignore all the other, you know, positive interactions, that, that we, because we're quite we're we're hypersensitive to criticism as human beings, and that that's a bit of a trap sometimes because we we ignore all the positives and we fix it on that. Is, is that right? Dean? Yeah, yeah, totally. That's um. That's a human threat detection mechanism. We are more sensitive to threats than we are to positive things, especially because like, we are generally just basic etiquette. You know, we don't walk around insulting people to their face. So we expect politeness or we expect to just manners on a default level. And when that's thwarted, that becomes more significant anyway. But yeah, we are more attuned to threats and dangers because those, you know, in, in an evolutionary sense, those are more risky. Those should get more attention because they could harm us, whereas a positive thing won't. And yeah, so like yeah, I can't imagine what it's like for a politician to have to deal with that all day every day. But we do fixate on those more, and it's um, and it's just it's just a byproduct of how we've evolved. And again, social media makes it a lot easier to be exposed to negative 
um, messages, negative uh, feedback, and you know just we, we we have to remember that's that's not necessarily what everyone thinks. That's just what was one person thinks, and they may not have the most uh, honest intentions when telling you. They may want to undermine you for their own personal reasons. So, yeah, we fixate more on the negative the negative stuff because of how we've evolved, but logically we shouldn't, and that's. No, it's, it's easier said than done, but there it is. I, I, as you say, on, on a planet of seven billion people, you know, most of us do rub along quite well. And <laughs> yeah. indeed, one of the positive things out of this COVID crisis is we've really valued, uh, uh, you know, our sense of community, and and you know that's that's you know the the the, the Thursday night claps, etc. There has been this outpouring of connection and 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 you know human uh, sense of. Of, of being together, which you know, I hope will stay with us anyway. Yeah, uh, hopefully. All right, great. Well, uh, it's been a real pleasure, uh, Dean. Thanks for uh, joining us, uh, Thank you, Adam. and uh, look forward to uh, further podcasts in the next few weeks as well. Okay. That's a lot. Thanks for that.